to us by the colonial powers, be it America or Siberia or anywhere else. I mentioned several uh, bicultural regions that we transcend the nation states. We transcend the borders, the state borders. And traditionally we moved freely because indigenous peoples know how to live in a reciprocal relationship with Mother Earth um, without destructing in reciprocity. Um, understanding that we are not the only or the highest intelligence on this planet. And we have to live in relationship with everything that surrounds us. What I learn and what I've learned to teach in my relationships with young people is that our people have always imagined something so much greater and profound than the conditions that they lived under. How do we respond to the kinds of harm and violence that happen all around us um, in ways that do not further produce it, make it bigger, agitate it? I'm much more interested in what I can learn, what we can learn about the subjective lives uh, of Black peoples who um, were, didn't have a sense of borders, but knew that, um, knew that moving into another country um, offered something different. Um, but over time, over hundreds of years, realized that, um, that white supremacy is transnational in every dimension. Um, and, you know, it creates new technologies across borders that are, that are historically located, um, but, um, um, but are, are deeply transnational. You know, that's, that's one of the things I'm thinking with coming into our conversation today. So I'll just stop. Oh, wow. So, um, so that, that's a, something that I continue to sit on is that can we or how can we and act transformative justice principles and practice those principles transnationally when there is this kind of, um, often misunderstanding due to our different social locations and also misunderstanding because there are state barriers that are limiting how we can engage with one another. What I think of building a future right? A future that allows us to own our bodies, to live freely, to live without fear of persecution, to live without fear of harms, where we can hold each other in our complexities, where we can, if we harm each other, that we can have systems in place that can allow us to have those conversations and to be able to process that in a way where we can come out uh, stronger. Right. When Hong Kongers, when protesters are saying that sex demand of disband the police, ultimately what they really want is not to not have police. I don't think that folks are there yet because there's still a lot of radical building and imagining that we need to do before we get there. Well, yeah, so I think that when, I, when I'm teaching reproductive justice too, I think I'm interested in hearing what Rachel said as well. They're always, we're always kind of bumping up against carceral feminism in the sense that we think that folks who have perpetuated intimate partner violence, rape, gender-based violence, locking these people up or um, kind of incarceration would be a good way out. But of course, like the research has shown us that oftentimes survivors end up getting incarcerated more. <laughs> Um, and so carceration then really is not the, the solution. Um, one of the, the, the most important things that I can say about transformative justice is that we cannot, um, it's impossible to, to, to do it well unless there is simultaneously community education, community study spaces, community praxis and learning spaces, because at the moment, right, um, from what we have been forced to engage with that we know was never meant to work uh, and that no, it doesn't serve us and was never meant to serve. History teaches us, history shows us what we don't want to repeat. And I think history is the key and the, to the door to that 
space of possibility, to that space of visioning, to that space of moving towards action, um, an action that can be rooted in something different as well. Um, so for me, you know, I'm constantly thinking about resistance.